Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, a good week for the Flames means, and Matt, I never thought I'd say this, a good week means that we're right behind the Edmonton Oilers in the Pacific Division standing. Usually that would be a bad week for this team. Um, should we jump right in and talk about the week that put us there? Well, it's you know it's early in the season when the Oilers are still actually playing hockey that matters. Well, usually if you and I came on and said, hey, it's a good week, but we're behind Edmonton, you'd think, what? If that's, that's a good week, a good what week. have they done for the rest of the season? Mm-hmm. So um, right now after, the, well, we'll talk about where we are now, but let's jump into this week's of, week of games. The Calgary Flames played on the 5th. Um, that was their first home game after their season-long road trip. Uh, they took on the Arizona Coyotes and ended up winning that one, a game a lot of people thought they wouldn't win after a long road trip. Usually that first one back is a tough one. Uh, and that was a 4-3 to three overtime win for the Flames. We gave up a point to the Coyotes, but... Ended up getting our own two points there. Goals from Goudreau is fourth. Um, Kachuk is eighth. Giordano his fourth. And Kachuk is ninth. So, again, Kachuk coming up big for this team and some of their big wins. Overall thoughts on this one, man? I thought that, by and large, Calgary played rather poorly for the first, like, 50 minutes or so. And they got bailed out by... A good play uh, by Kachuk on the 3-2 goal and the lucky bounce on the, the equalizer. And this should have been a game that the Flames lost. This They and, played about how I expected them to after coming back from that long road trip. We didn't expect a great game, and I think we got exactly what we yeah. bargained for. Yeah, and ex- that's exactly the point when I was doing my weekly predictions last week, that usually that first game back's always a bear. And it was. The Flames didn't have their legs for the first 40 minutes and even struggled a bit in the third period and then that you know they got a bounce and then another one and all of a sudden they're in overtime and Kachuk took over again yeah and the game winner here uh scored with 35 seconds remaining in the overtime those were always I mean I I remember watching this one going oh I think this is gonna end up as a shootout and I don't know if I want to shoot out here and it's always kind of fun as a fan to get those last minute goals Yeah, and at least Kachuk uh, saved himself an extra 30 seconds there instead of waiting until the last second like last week. He's getting better at that. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, to me, not a lot to talk about here. The Flames probably shouldn't have won this, but you know what? Sometimes good teams get lucky, and lucky teams can be good, and I think this is one where the Flames got lucky, everything aligned, and, um, you know, you'll take the two points, right? Yeah, it, it's not the way anybody would have drawn it up. And, uh, you know, even after the game, both Peters and Kachuk were critical of how they played in that game. And they shouldn't have won. But, hey, two points, awesome. On to the next one. Well, and it's interesting you mentioned Peters. So even after that game, he mentioned his veterans need to be better. That was his quote. And mm-hmm. calling his team out the day after a practice. Like, usually after a win, you're not calling your team out. But... Good to finally hear him doing that. I think it's maybe too late in the season. We haven't really heard him call the team out yet, but it looks like it's working. Well, especially the team, they still look like they're disjointed overall. And the talent on the team is the only reason why they are where they're at. And like up until, like even through the St. Louis game this week, they still have not played proper at all and even though like there's fifth in the nhl in points right now which is you know a testament to how talented a team they are that they've been playing extremely poorly for most of the season and yet still are in the upper tier and this team like if they can start to get everything clicking together and especially number 13 he seemed he needs to find some happiness in his game because he's just seems to be frustrated with everything lately and his game's been off for the entire season and i think it like if he can get he going does seem to then be coming the, back around this week though yeah it's just that like he needs to have fun out there and like whenever you see him 
out there, he seems to just be a little frustrated with everything, and I think if he can get into a good mood on the ice and things start working for him, I think that the whole team will start playing better on the overall. Well, the next game, I think the Flames did play better on the overall. This was the uh, the next game, the Thursday night game for the Calgary Flames when the New Jersey Devils, or Taylor Hall and company, since that's really all they've got, came to town. And we were pretty much expecting the Flames to play well here. The Flames did. They got a 5-2 to two victory. Uh, Flames goals, Derek Ryan is third of the year. Monaghan got his fourth. Backlund got his third. Hannafin got his third. And Goudreau got his fifth. So really, Monaghan and Goudreau uh, both getting in there. Lindholm picked up an assist on the Goudreau goal. That first line got their goals here. But also, I, I would say for Hannafin, probably the best game we've seen him play as a Flame here. Yeah, and he's starting to look like a number one defenseman, and he's only 21. Well, I told you when we acquired him, I think he's the heir apparent for Gio's job. Yeah, and uh, like honestly, that trade is looking more and more like the Gilmore trade, but in reverse, where we we actually won the deal hands down. Well, and and I think if you look at the whole deal, including, you know, the picks that we made, we ended up making because of that. I mean, Anderson came out of that. Shillington came out of that. Like those three defensemen I look at as all sort of part of the deal and byproducts of the deal. That's uh, a heck of uh, you know, I mean, that's half of your defense right there. Oh, I know. And like that, uh, the initial trade was uh, Hamilton and two seconds for, uh, yeah, for a first and two seconds, and then uh, we traded a third, two thirds to get the second to draft Shillington, and we used another second to draft Anderson, and then Hannaf- Hamilton for Hannafin. Yeah, like I get, you're right. It's not all part of the same trade, but I kind of look at it as the same you they, know, sort yeah. of the dominoes effect. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and all of them are the same age and like if you can lock them all up to long-term contracts, I know Anderson's I believe done at the end of the year. Uh you know, and like if you can have them all on the same term and growing together, add Valimaki in and if they all continue to show the potential that they are moving forward, then this team will have a excellent top 4 for a long time. Talking about the Flames uh, needing their veterans to do better, as Peter said in this one. Changes some D pairings, actually all three D pairings in this one. The first pairing for this game was Giordano Hamannick. The second was Hannafin Anderson, so breaking up that Hamannick Hannafin pair. And the third pair, Brody Stone. Uh, the other big change that we saw to the veterans, if you will, for a leak scratch in this game. A healthy scratch, nothing wrong, just a healthy scratch here. Um, let's start from the second story first does it surprise you at all the fro leak gets scratched not at all he's been relegated to the third and fourth lines at some points i think at this point it's hard to make a trade as we've talked about with where we are cap wise but i think this might be the message you're trying to send by by benching a i don't want to say expendable but benching a veteran you can afford to bench yeah, and Frolik needs to be better. And for most of the games that he's played, like you expect him to be the consistently decent defensive forward. If he chips in offense, great, but that's not the necessary thing from Frolik. And he's been bad defensively for most of the season, and he's just been okay on the offensive side. And it makes entire sense for them to bench him and he he needs to get his head in the game. He is not going to be here at the end of the season, uh, like after this season and he'll likely be included in a trade at the deadline and you know, it, for cap purposes. And if he wants to have a career beyond this, instead of being a uh, invitee like uh, Troy Brower was with St. Louis today, then he has to pick up his game. Otherwise, he's going to be relegated to going back to Europe after this contract's over. Yeah, I mean, I've said it before. In two years, we're going to need to find 23 more NHL players when Vegas comes in. So there's going to be guys that maybe wouldn't get a job that would there. But I agree with you. I think if he you know, sits out most of the season, it's too bad because we're paying him a lot of money to sit in the press box. But I don't think we're going to miss him. And I think that might... I don't want to say it'll be his last NHL deal, but I think he would have to take a significant pay cut next year if he wanted to come back to the NHL. Yeah, I think... And there's a lot of teams that take him on for a million, million and a half. 
Yeah, probably. And that's probably the all he'd get at uh, this point. Um, the other story we mentioned about the veterans switching up the defensive pairs here. Giordano Hamannick is pair one. Hannafin and Anderson is pair two. Brody and Stone is pair three. What do you think of those pairs, and what did you think of them in this game? I thought they were pretty good. I have no real complaints. I think Hamannick played better uh, with Giordano, and Hannafin and Anderson, that's going to be your number one pairing in like a year or two. So, you know, getting them used to each other is a good thing. And, you know, Brody and Stone, two quality veterans, and go from there. I really thought that, you know, Hamannick having his best night, it shows what we've talked about before. Whatever Giordano touches turns to gold. I mean, we saw him play with Anderson. We've seen him play with Brody. Now we've seen him play with Hamannick. They've all looked good when they've played with him. I think whoever his partner is is always going to get a boost there. Um, I wasn't a fan of seeing it broken up at first, but I think it turned out well. Yeah, I agree. Um, Interesting in this game, only two Flames did not have a shot on goal. Do you want to guess who they were? Jankowski and Lucic. No, Jankowski is one of them. Manjapani was the other one. Okay, there you go. Um, talking to some of the Flames in the dressing room afterwards, I kept hearing from guys that they think this might have been the closest to a complete game that they've played all year. They were really happy with uh, where they're at, with... Um, how many games they've played with how they played the game with how many, you know, rotations everybody got through just everything that was going on, whether it was line length, shift length, um, how they played the 60 minutes. A lot of guys thought that this was the best they've looked from beginning to end. And I'd be hard pressed to argue that. What about you? Yeah. Well, it also helps that New Jersey is an extremely bad team and they really are just terrible. And the flames should walk all over a team like St. Louis or Nat New Jersey and they did and like New Jersey has 14 points in 16 games and are second last or third last in the east and uh fifth last overall in the NHL so the Flames should put this team away yeah but I mean we've seen the Flames play teams like that in the past Matt you and I know you know, pretty well that the flames will go into a team where they should win. And what will we see? We'll end up seeing the flames come in, don't play great to start the game. Let the other team get in, you know, three or four goals. And then it's like, Oh, we should probably finish this one off and just barely win it. So yeah. And the flames kind of did that in this game. Like it was, it finished five, two, but New Jersey was up two one at one point. Yeah. But even when they were up two one, I never felt like they took real, they, I didn't feel like they took over on the ice. No, it seemed like that was like their only two scoring chances in the game, yeah, really. And, and that's kind of what I mean, though, right? Often we'll kind of let the other team dictate the play. We'll end up having to play their game. Um, but in this one, I felt like the Flames dictated the play for the whole game. And that's really where we need them to be if they're going to be a top team in the league. Yep. And talking about top teams in the league, uh, Saturday night, Hockey Night in Canada, the St. Louis Blues defending Stanley Cup champions came to town. And not probably the result Flames fans wanted, but the result that I think you and I both uh, thought might happen, and that's a Flames loss taking on the Stanley Cup champions. Luckily, it was an OT loss. The Flames at least skated away with one point here. Um, Goals by Matthew Gachuk, his 10th, and Travis Hamanick, his first of the season. Overall thoughts against the champions. St. Louis is a very good defensive team. And you really saw that here, didn't you? Yeah, and Calgary can... like If it was me and I was running the video, it would basically be games like this where you have a really top-tier defensive team to try and use moments from when the Blues shut the Flames down to try and teach how to play that elite level defense and you know calgary has the talent where they can do what st louis did and what teams like boston can do or washington it's just that they have to learn how to do that at the nhl level and to this point they've been ineffective at it but talent wise the flames you know they were able to push their way back into a tie in and force the game to overtime and you know you can get by a lot 
through a lot of things when you have as much talent as the Flames, but they, you know, the Blues won because of their defensive abilities. You know what, though? One point against the champs based on how the Flames have played so far this year, I think that's a pretty good outcome. Yeah, I agree. You know, it was more than I was expecting. I thought it was going to be an outright loss and wouldn't have been surprised if it was a blowout even. And the Blues, like, that was their seventh straight win, too. So it's not like they were playing poorly like they've been on a roll themselves heading into that game so it you know it, there's room for improvement for the flames and a lot of room for improvement frankly but it, you're starting to see small little steps in the right direction and you know they need to be able to use games like this one to take that next step and learn how to win at the nhl level and be a contending team and like that's the next step for this team is learning how to be an elite team i think that the flames didn't look great for the first half of the first and then they really turned it on here um you were mentioning you know how good the blues are defensively calgary had 24 giveaways and i think a lot of that is just the the blues uh back check and their ability to you know take the lanes out and make us make decisions that we didn't need to and i saw that more often than not where a guy would have the puck, he'd be on the boards in the offensive zone and have nowhere to go with it, and he'd just kind of dump it to the middle of the ice and the Blues player would pick it up. Yeah, and that's what good defensive teams do. Like you're, Especially when it comes time for the playoffs, you have zero time, zero space, and you have to make plays in order to beat the other teams. And you know, you're know, that's what you're going to be facing every game. And if you want to actually you know win a series or you know contend for a cup you're going to have to figure out ways of being able to execute your game plan in that kind of coverage and be able to shut them down in the same manner yeah i also thought here um you know talking about their defensive play st louis is is calgary really didn't get a lot of good shots like they did a great job of clogging up the shooting lanes making us shoot from angles that we knew we weren't going to go in. Even the two that we got, I didn't think were great goals. They were, you know, they were hard. They were goals that took a lot of hard work, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, especially the Hamannick goal, that was kind of a weird, choppy play. Yeah. That, you know, like, it made a weird carom off the net, and the goalie misplayed it because it made the weird carom off of the net. And, yeah. It is what it is. Yeah, like there just there wasn't a lot in this game where I could say, "Wow, the Flames look really good." They didn't look bad, but I thought that you could definitely tell we were playing against the Stanley Cup champions, and you can tell in this case. I think Calgary's built for offense, and St. Louis is built for defense, and I think that you know because of that, they were sort of stuck in the middle for most of the game. Yeah, and Calgary needs to figure out because they have the talent where they should be able to figure out how to play that shutdown defensive style as well and make things effective at both ends of the ice it's just well we see you know, the blues it's again a work in progress we'll see them on the 21st so we'll see if we can play them any differently in that game yeah and that'll be in st louis i don't even know what their arena is called anymore it used to be well it was the scott trade yeah scott trade scott trade was uh-huh. arizona wasn't it i have no idea i don't know doesn't matter the st louis event center we'll call it that since we're not using the word arena anymore i'm just gonna start calling everything an event center um matt the other thing that we noted in this game was the same defensive pairings that we mentioned earlier for most of the game and michael it's the enterprise center now okay, but... it was the scott trade center ah, okay there you go um michael for league sat out again and yeah. I mean, at this point, do you think that we see him back as a healthy player for the Flames if nobody else is hurt, or do you think he's now been relegated to healthy scratch for most of the season? Well, I I think you give him another shot, but frankly, like Tobias Reeder and Alan Quine have both been better than what Frolik has brought this year, and that's saying a lot, and... You know, then you got guys on Stockton that are starting to play well. Like Matthew Phillips had five points today. Um, you've got guys like Buddy Robinson and Glenn Godin and Dylan Dubé that are all pushing for an NHL spot. 
it, like if you're not pulling your own weight you know there's plenty of other options and like even guys like jankowski like i wouldn't be comfortable you know if i was either for Lake or jankowski of remaining in the lineup or in the nhl even well right now yeah. i think janko's safe because we got no money to bring anyone else up true but you Unless know it's find just a buyer. yeah it's just tough right at this point in time but uh yeah, you know, I think that like eventually when it comes closer to the end of the season that Frolik will be traded where it like the Flames are making their deadline acquisition of like insert name of second line winger here and just to make the dollars work Frolik gets included. And it's like said player for random picks or prospects and Do you think oh, we can call back in Minnesota Frolik. and get the Zucker deal done? That would be awesome, frankly. Like, I'm all for that. And, you know, Minnesota's looking to rebuild as well because they're kind of terrible right now. And if they can shed $5 million bucks, I think they're, they'd be more than happy with that. So, Well, I think, what was the deal? It was supposed to be Fro Leak and Jankowski, I think? Uh, I I heard it was a second end for Leak for Zucker. Something like that. And, like, even if that was the cost, it'd be like, okay, sure, yeah, fine. Yeah, I think I think that second we'll talk more about the deadline when we get closer, but I think that Brody might move at the deadline. I think they're gonna need his money to re sign a guy like uh, Anderson. And I bet you could easily recoup that second with Brody. Yeah, it well, it really just depends on like how Valimaki's doing, for one. Um, I like really hope when Valley comes back, they send him to Stockton because I didn't think he should have been brought up last year, and I think he's going to be rusty. Like I think putting him in Stockton yeah, for the rest of the year is the best thing to do. Yeah, well, it just depends on like where he's at and like if he can. Like I'm assuming that he'll be uh, in Stockton at least for a few weeks just to get his legs going, like a mini training camp kind of thing. Um, but you know like depending on how he's doing i think that'll depend like that'll make you the decision whether or not to trade brody yeah because like if like valimaki is playing poorly uh you know you can't really deal brody without replacing him with another decent defenseman and you know you could do that too like it, you know there's well and i mean right now in the last two games brody has been a third pairing defenseman like i think you know even a brandon davidson or a renat valiev out of uh you know stockton i think there's guys that if we're looking at brody's a third pairing guy you could fill or i mean third pairing guys are always coming up on waivers too like there's there's ways to fill that and you know like you can get a solid enough guy like fantenberg was last season for a fourth so like, well, that's it. You know, I think you could flip enough guys around to the deadline where you get Brody out for value, flip, you know, get a guy like Fattenberg, like you said, for a fourth or for Jankowski or something like that. I think we could easily fill that role if we need to make a move. Mm-hmm. You know, Fattenberg to me was perfectly serviceable in that role. Yeah, I like, I wish that we would have had enough room to keep him because I think that he would have been perfectly fine as a third pairing defenseman for the season, but you know it is what it is it's too bad that even when guys are scratched they count against your salary cap because if you look at it i think that alan quine has now replaced um fro leak i think quine will be up here as long as we can afford him and he's making seven hundred thirty-five thousand, where fro leak's making i think 4.3 million so you know you've you've had a guy like fro leak who's really been i would say replaced by a much cheaper pick and for the flames right now that's what they need um, I, I see no reason unless there's an injury or you just want to try to get him going again that you make Michael Frolik a regular. He hasn't looked great this year. Yeah, and you give him another shot. Like last year, he was benched a couple of times, and that was when the whole he asked for a trade thing came out. And, you know, like it, he, to his credit, played better after he was healthy scratched. And I think that if he can respond by playing well, then... You know, you keep him in the lineup, but it, it's, yeah. If I look at what he's making on this team, like he's making 4.3. The only guys making more than him for forwards are Lindholm, uh, Lucic, Backlund, Monaghan, Goudreau, and Kachuk. And even though guys like Goudreau and 
Backlund aren't looking great. I would say even, you know, Monaghan, they're still, I think, providing a lot more value than that. You know, and when you look at guys below him like Derek Ryan, um, Alan Quine, Andrew Mangiapane, it's tough to really justify putting a $4.3 million player in the lineup. Oh, for sure. And, like, he doesn't look like even a $2 million player at this point. And I mean, it, he, you could say he lost his job to Quine or Reader. Both are making less than 800000 Yeah. So, we'll see. You know, like, this... Uh, it's just frustrating when this... When players, like, for a leak just regress significantly and like sort of like neil did last year where it was just like he was awful and it kind of throws everything out of alignment because like you can't really do anything to actually fix it until near the trade deadline and i'm expecting the flames to eventually you know figure out that second line right wings position and you know perhaps getting another depth forward but yeah, it, you just wish that the guys that are in the organization would actually figure out how to take spots properly. And, See, you I, know, like, Frolik has been so good for so long that, uh, you know, you kind of just expect him to be that second line, third line guy. And, yeah. But you and I have said for years, too, that he was playing above his head, right? Like, he shouldn't be a second line guy. He, he meshed on that 3M line. But, I mean, realistically, on a good team, he's probably your third-line winger. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think that you mentioned, um, you know, James Neal last year. The big difference for me, there were times last year Neal was a liability on the ice. I have yet to see Froelich be a liability. He hasn't been good. He hasn't contributed. But I haven't seen Froelich this year be a liability yet. Yeah, true enough. You know, like, even if you need to give him some games to get him going, I'm fine to do that if... You know, it's just about, hey, the guy's not contributing, but we want to get him some shifts. But when you've got guys like Brower or Neal who were costing the Flames, you know, goals or chances or they were liabilities out there, that's when you say, put this guy on the bench as soon as we can. Yeah. Well, it's just like when the Flames had guys like Chris Stewart or uh, Freddie Modine or Nick Grossman that uh, you know where they just their presence on the ice just was a detriment that's how bad yeah we Neil also weren't paying year. those guys four million though yeah or five in neil's case but this i think is going to uh, be another one of those summer acquisitions we've now seen it with uh i think fro leak this year we saw it with neil we saw it with brower where early in his career here tree was going out overpaying for a winger and then realizing, oh, crap, maybe that guy wasn't worth that amount. And I think Froelich has been serviceable enough. That's why he's still here. But I think when we look back, that whole grouping of guys will be, you know, the, the July 1st buyer's remorse moves. Brigade, yeah. Well, it, it, there's you can only plan for so many things. Like, it, Neil had been a consistent 20-plus goal guy his entire career, and then his game just vanished. Like, you know, you, you can't really no, help but, that. No, but it just, it happened one after oh, another after another. I, you know, every every GM's entitled to one or two bad moves, but it just, Tree kept making the same mistake over and over and over again. I know. Well, hopefully that's out of his system and hopefully he, he can make this another. Year, but he couldn't afford to do it this year. Yeah. Well, hopefully, like, he can make some other trades towards the deadline that'll fix the problems without needing to go and sign anybody. I'll be curious to see if they end up putting Froelich back in against Dallas. I don't think they will. I think he's out for the foreseeable future unless there's another injury. Yeah. Well, if the other guys are playing well, you know, it's not fair to them if they're actually doing well to, you know, it's just like a backup goalie. If, you know, the starter is on a roll, you just kind of have to bide your time until either the guy cools off or, you know, it's a back-to-back -back situation or something like that. And for leak, I think we'll have to wait until those guys have a bad game. So, Matt, we saw earlier this season Tobias Reeder put on waivers, never sent to the AHL. At this point, if you think that you're done with for leak, would you waive him just to see if anyone would take him off your hands? Yeah, sure. Why not? I don't think anyone wants to touch him, but why not try it out and see? And often we see guys put on waivers and then traded the week after. 
because now they've cleared. Yeah, and there's a number of teams, like especially like if you look at any of the rebuilding ish teams, like if they wanted to do some of their homework early, and like say LA wants to trade Tyler to Foley, and the Flames can work a deal with that, you know, a guy like Froelich makes sense in that trade where he's just a part to equalize the contracts and you know figure out all the rest of whatever the acquisition cost would be but yeah i think that whether it's waivers or just an outright trade i i think that for leaks time is quickly dwindling to an end in the flames system even if the flames didn't get a to foley but even if they trade him somewhere like an ottawa for a you know a third round pick i think the only way ottawa takes him is if they say you know what this guy would be a good guy to have around the organization we're gonna bring him in this year and then you know try to get the deal done for next year at a lower cost but we want that first right to talk to him by bringing him in this year and see what he's got i think that's the only time you would you'd find a buyer for him before I agree. the deadline. You know, a team says, yeah, okay, maybe we want to bring him in. We got the money. Let's bring him in. Let's talk to him. Let's see what he can do. And, you know, we'll try to get done while he's here. Yeah. I don't know who that team is, but I could see. And I think as, as injuries start to mount, that's where you might see that trade happening as well. Mm-hmm. Um, another transaction this week, not just guys sitting or shuffling around the lineup, but a change the lineup. Oliver Shillington was sent to Stockton AHL. Brandon Davidson recalled. Brandon Davidson is a uh, twenty, what is he, twenty-eight year old defenseman. Uh, played last year in Edmonton and started the year in in Stockton. Um, he's now up here as the number seven. I think this is a good deal. I think um, you know we had too many defensemen. They want to get Stone going. It looks like, and if they're going to get Stone going, I'd rather the Chillington not sit on the bench. Let's send him to the A. Let's get him some reps because for young players, you and I have talked about reps are important. And you know what? I'm fine if Davidson's number seven. So I like this move. Yeah, Davidson, you don't really care in terms of like his trajectory for his career. Well, he's 28. I mean, his. I think we've seen what we're going to see out of him. Yeah, and so having him as just the in-case-of-emergency guy in the NHL is perfectly fine and it's a reward after his good start to the season. Shillington needs to get better on lots of little things. And like the coaching staff said that uh, he needs to work on becoming a penalty killer. And frequently, like if you look at like uh, Svechnikov's uh, goal, uh, that uh, lacrosse style goal, like, Shilling, that was Shillington's spot where he should have been covering. And, like, there's lots of little things defensively that Shillington's still a little iffy on. He's getting better, like, don't get me wrong, and he's looking more like an NHL defenseman, but he still needs to work on his defense. And so him getting number one minutes in Stockton will help him to figure those things out. And he scored a hat-trick the other day. and it, He scored a hat-trick, it, but he was still minus two on the game. Yeah. Well, that was a bizarre game. That's it was a, a seven six. To do. Yeah. Well, at least it wasn't like Brett Lebda, uh, who was a minus three and a nine three win, once for Toronto. So you know, like that's a bizarre one, but you know, I, it happens. <laughs> I think if you look at you know again the pairings here of Geo Hamannick, you're not going to usurp either of those guys. Hannafin Anderson, you're not going to usurp those guys. Brody, you're not going to usurp him. So really, you're trying to swap minutes between Stone and. Um, Shillington. Shillington's the only guy who's AHL eligible. So I think right now he's not going to, he's not going to improve playing third pairing minutes with Brody or stone or whoever they put there. So yeah, I think the right thing to do move him to the A. It doesn't mean he won't be back, but just like Dubé, I think the best place for him to develop right now is the American hockey league. Yeah. And it's just like Val Mackey when he comes back, having both of them, like if Shillington's still down there, having them together as a pairing and see if you can't get some chemistry between them. And, you know, because, like, if, say next year, like, if the D, D pairings are Giordano, Hamannick, Hannafin, Anderson, Valimaki, and Shillington, like, that's a fairly good group of defensemen. And you don't really have anything to worry about yeah, on I the think, defensive side. I think just cost-wise, Hamannick will be gone this year. 
Uh, yeah, I don't see him costing much more than the like he's making four and a half, and but I don't I, I see need it. money from either him or Brody to resign Anderson. Yeah, and I'd expect most of Brody's extension, Brody's contract to go to Anderson. Okay. So you think Brody will be gone? Hamannick sticks around. Yeah, well, you got to look at uh, styles of defensemen, right? And Giordano, Hannafin, Anderson, Shillington, and Valimaki are all of that two-way ish kind of guy where Hamannick's really the only defensive defenseman purely in the in, it, uh, in our organization so that's why I'd keep him over Brody just because of that fact just because we have replacements for uh for Brody of the similar style yeah it makes sense well, talking about Stockton, uh, you and I promised this week that we would have a special segment. This is our first in what will be a series. The next one will be sometime in December with Jeff Gregory, the man known online as Stockton's Finest. And he and I chatted today about the Stockton Heat. This is a long segment. It's over an hour. So if our listeners don't want to listen uh, to this or don't want to listen to it all, so you might want to skip ahead for our predictions. But we had a year and a half to cover. We haven't really talked to him since... I'd say the modern age of the heat. So let's uh, let's t- chat with Jeff. Well, we're here for a brand new segment on Fireside Chat, and uh, this is a segment that we are bringing in a correspondent from Stockton to talk heat. Matt and I have tried to talk the heat for a number of years, and we're just reading what's online, and a lot of times we took info right from this guy's article, so we figured let's get it right from the horse's mouth. Uh, without further ado, Jeff Gregory, welcome to Fireside Chat. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we uh, were interested in your take on the heat. But before we get started, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about who you are? Well, Dan, I, again, I really appreciate you guys reaching out to me and um, and asking. I, I love doing this stuff. So I, um, I've i been a hockey fan. I went to my first hockey game in 1992 when the Sharks came here. Uh, my wife got me tickets and to the old uh, Cow Palace, which is appropriately named. And I watched Pittsburgh beat the Sharks in the first year, like 10 nothing. Um, I had been a hockey fan on TV before that, back in the 80s and late 80s, and just really loved the game and, and all the nuances. Uh, watching game live versus uh, on TV is, is a lot of you – know, it just brings, it brings the game faster. You realize how fast the game is and the speed. Um, when the Stockton Thunder were here um, – starting in 2005, we, we went to the occasional game. We weren't really as diehard uh, as we are now. We, we'd still caught uh, a fair amount of, of Sharks games during the year as well. Uh, and then when the heat came in, uh, we kind of got, we kind of got hooked and decided that uh, we, we would buy and plunge into season tickets. So about halfway through the first season in the 2014 or 2015 season, uh, we ended up buying uh, the remainder of the season and have been going to to games ever since. Uh, we catch obviously all the home games for Stockton Heat, with the exception of the the rare, you know, Monday one o'clock game. Or that's a weird time for a game. Eh, it's a holiday, and sometimes they do that. And they've done some holiday games where not everybody gets a holiday off. Um, so we we miss some of those. And um, but overall, we catch. Um, we catch all of the season. We we've gone to Bakersfield a few times. We've gone to San Jose to go see the Heat there, uh, to to catch some road games. It's always good to go into an opposing barn. Uh, and included in that, over the last three or four years, we've we've made our trip to Calgary to go see the Flames in in Calgary uh, last year. And this year, we're going to Vancouver as well uh, to catch the Flames there. We we'll see five or six Golden Knights games down in Vegas. Uh, occasionally go see a, a, a Sharks game, but we try Do to get time. It's that you get to see a golden Knights game with the flames on the road. We try, but the last couple of years, it's always been that they're in town on a Tuesday night. And when we go into town, it's usually a Thursday through Monday. So we, we've missed it a few times. Um, I'm still trying to work that schedule to where we can be down there and see a flames game. Uh, the one thing good about about going to see Vegas is it's not it's not the rare occasion to see an opposing jersey there uh, or a third of the stadium in opposing jerseys. So it, and and they're nice, they're friendly. 
Um, and and most most fans are around around the NHL. So we yeah, Matt and I remembered a segment last year on Hockey Night in Canada when they were playing Edmonton and Vegas, and they showed they said there's ten thousand Oilers fans here in the arena tonight. And I said to Matt, "There's still ten thousand Oilers fans." <laughs> We were down there for a New Year's Eve game a couple of years ago when they played Toronto, and I would say about a third of that stadium was was Maple Leafs fan. You saw blue and red everywhere. You see the same here at the Dome. Yeah, it's um, it, it's such a great sport. It's such a great sport live, and whether it's an AHL level or NHL level, it, you could definitely tell the difference. I, I I always tell my wife the difference between the NHL and AHL is about a half a second or a full second because NHLers react that much quicker. And you see the HL, AHL guys kind of hesitate for a second, but it's a, it's really a fun league. You can get up and close and personal uh, in the AHL and uh, you know, they do things in minor league games that you don't see on an NHL level. And it's, it's always a good time. And at first we were kind of going, are we really going to want to see 34 games a year? Are we really going to want to go Wednesday nights at seven o'clock? But I'll tell you what, my my phone is set with the schedule, and I get out of the Bay Area uh, well in advance of getting home, changing into my my jersey, game more jerseys, um, and and going to the to the arena to be there by the time the puck drops. And we we usually kind of go into summer withdrawals without hockey when it's not here. And again, a four hour drive to Bakersfield in September just to go see live hockey. Wow. We miss it a lot. Yeah. Well, for the, uh, for those of you that don't know you, you can also read Jeff's articles and we'll, we'll plug them at the end of this segment as well, but you've, you can read him or may have read him in the past on uh flamesnation.ca as well. He writes a regular article there talking about the Stockton uh, heat. Jeff, you mentioned earlier that you see, saw some Stockton Thunder games. For those that don't know, that was the old ECHL team there. What are the big differences you notice in the game for those that have never seen them live between ECHL level of hockey and the AHL? Well, ECHL to me, it was more you, – you definitely saw more fights in ECHL than you do in AHL. And uh, I think that, that, has, uh, that has really become a, a big difference between the two. Um, but the speed of the game, uh, the structure, the setup, and a lot of ECHL teams are independent. So you don't have uh, the connection between, in this case, Stockton and Calgary. You have an ECHL team that is loosely based with a team or two teams um, that are uh, that are affiliated. I know Kansas City is affiliated with, with Calgary. Uh, but there still are a lot of players that aren't under contract with Calgary in in Kansas City. They're they're just signed on a on a free agent basis. Um, it the play is a little more. Again, it's a it's a double A versus triple A versus major league. Um, so it's a little it's a little more sporadic. It's a little more, it's more up and down. Um, but it's it's still it's still a good it's a, still a good product. I mean, obviously you're not paying NHL prices to go see a, an ECHL game, but you'll see the occasional you know, guy who's coming up who has played a year in the AHL, come down to ECHL, or trying to work his way up the ladder. Um, so it's a little more sloppier, uh, but not not as much as you would you would tend to to think. Um, it, it's a rookie league. I always call it it's a rookie league. I mean, you go from the OHL or the CHL into to the ECHL. Guys who weren't drafted trying to make a, a point, they have you know they have hockey to play. And then you've got guys like and I'm going to use them just because I I remember seeing them last year. Ryan Farragher, who is 29 years old, he's still playing hockey. He's that's what he does. He's he's a goalie for for Idaho, and he gets called up to the AHL by by chance and he's probably played for five or six different teams uh in the HL last year uh, or throughout his career uh as opposed to being tied down to a single franchise makes sense yeah we've we've heard i mean i've seen some ECHL stuff never live but on uh, you know watch online and stuff and it just seems to be a lot more scrambly and less a lot less hockey sense i guess you could say the the guys don't seem to have that same sense of 
what they're doing in the offensive zone. It's just get the puck towards the net, and that's about the only game plan. It's pod, it's pod hockey, you know, beer league hockey. I, I've never At a played. So, level. yeah, exactly. And and it's they're not getting paid a whole lot, but they're having they're having fun. And as I say, some guys are down there specifically to to be in a system to to try to work on their game and and hopefully get noticed by somebody to to get called up to the AHL. Well, especially for goalies, it's a good place to park them instead of, you know, making them the third goalie at the AHL level. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about that a little later because I have some opinions about goalies. So, Well, let's talk first about how the team's doing this year. The Stockton Heat are 13 games into their season. They have eight wins, two losses, uh, one overtime loss, and two shutout losses for 19 points. That's put them second in the Pacific Division. Jeff, you have a better sense of this season than I do. Um, what, what would you tell us about the season so far? Well, the season is, is gone. Well, it, it has, um, it really, it's off to a fast pace. I think this group is, is more, uh, defined as, um, they're more defined who they are. They play more cohesive group. The, he rolls, you know, Kale McLean, the coach rolls four lines. He's not, uh, he's not afraid to, to do that. Uh, whether they're up in a tight game uh, or down in a tight game, they will still roll four lines. Um, he last year he um, last year he he mixed lines quite a bit. Um, you know, pulling out the blender and and changing lines uh, for my for my viewing seemed like almost every period, or even for that matter, from shift to shift. He's pretty much left the line stable this year. So. Um, and we have better experienced defense this year. They brought in La- Zach Leslie from Chicago Wolves, who took the Wolves to a Calder Cup final last year. Um, he he came in to kind of settle the back end. The defense last year was pretty porous. Um, I'd like to call it the Matador defense. Um, they they really didn't help out their goalies last year. Our our goalies last year got beat beat up bad. And a lot of that had to do with the defense that was in front of them. Uh, Forwards wise, scoring wise last year, they had a good group of forwards uh, in front of them, but you know, the six or seven call-ups during the year doesn't help the AHL team uh, with its goal to get to the Calder cup finals or, or playoffs. And, and last year's team was, was kind of like that. They, there wasn't a whole lot of talent on the back end to help them keep the, the puck out of the net. This year, completely different uh, with the Russian duo of, of uh, Valiev and, and Yelisin who play together. Um, they're a steady second pair. They, they, they know how to get the puck out of the zone. That's, they know how to move people away uh, from the front of the net. Uh, Davidson, who just got called up, is, uh, was a very steady presence. He's a good defensive defenseman even though he's second on the team with points with 10 uh, he's got a good shot but he 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 mans the blue line really really well um, so overall the the team is is it's more of a cohesive group they they're all kind of on the same page last year it kind of seemed with people got pulled up uh, early in the season and the new coaching staff that came in and the just the kind of sense of what are we, what are we doing? I think everybody is still trying to gel and it just, it started off bad and kind of just kept going that way. They ended up at 500 uh, surprisingly. Um, but this year's, this year's squad is just much more focused, uh, a little more experience. Uh, the, the, the flames prospects that are here are another year older. Uh, they get the system. And just overall, it's a, it's, they're fun to watch. They're never out of a game. Would you say, look, I mean, I'm just looking at this roster here and I think part of, at least from an outsider's perspective, looking at where they made some strides is a lot more veteran guys in the team this year. And, and a lot of people don't realize the, the rules on AHL regarding veterans and what's classified as a, as a veteran, um, the the veteran is if you have 320 professional games and i'm trying to get to it right now the 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 rules here if you are more if you have more than 320 professional games played you're classified as a veteran uh in 
in the AHL. And you can only ice uh, five veterans. Now I'm going to have to look this up. I apologize. Um, you can only ice five veterans on a team at a time that are below that 320 veteran rule. Um, so you can go out and sign everybody that you want. There, There is not, unlike, unlike the NHL, there's not a limit on the roster uh, in the AHL. It's just that you cannot dress more than five veterans. Uh, and are goalies included or exempt in that rule? Goalies are included. Yeah. So it is, um, it's definitely a, you're definitely playing your prospects, but you do have to. And that's what they want, right? I mean, the HL is a development league. They don't want you to just stock up a bunch of veterans. Correct. They they don't want, you know, 20 guys who were in the NHL last year, uh, you know, they don't want them suiting up and, and somebody just blowing through the league. They want, they want the prospects. They want the younger guys to come in, um, you will get the occasional 30, 31 year old. And a couple of years ago, the, the heats captain, um, uh, Rod Pelly was here. He was 31, but he was the veteran presence to, to bring these, these guys aboard. Um, I remember that's not 320 NHL games. That's all pro games. That's Europe. That's AHL. That's ECHL, NHL. That is correct. It is, it is pro games. That's something that we often have our fans forget is it's not 320 games in the NHL. It's any pro league. And that really cuts down on the the number of you know guys that are going to be under that threshold as well because there's a lot of career HLers that eventually hit that threshold because they've just been doing this for a while. Yeah, here's, here's what it actually states, and I'm going to quote verbatim here from the AHL. Of the 18 skaters, not counting the two goalies, and you're correct with that, the team must dress for a game at least 13 qualified as development or play, development players. Of those 13, 12 must have played in 260 or fewer professional games, including AHL, NHL, Europe, elite leagues. And one must have played in 320 or fewer professional games. So that's your, that's your cutoff. Uh, so you could, if, if you're under 260 you could put 12 out there. Uh, you, you could put all 19 if you wanted to. It's not that. But you cannot dress more than um, more than those five players. Yeah, that's definitely – I'm glad you brought that up. That's something that a lot of NHL fans forget in the difference between the two leagues. In the NHL, you can dress anyone um, as long as there's no more than 18 of them. But you've got to watch that upper – sort of upper game limit in the AHL. Yeah, and right now I think the, the Heat have – uh, we have 20, actually we have 30 players on our roster, um, right now. Some of them are, are hurt. Um, and some of them are back down. So I think we're, we're down to 28 or 27, uh, maybe 26 or 27. And you'll traditionally see bigger rosters in the HL for that reason that they need to account for call-ups. Well, and you have also the amateur tryouts, uh, the PTO still are down here, um, you know, last year Scott Sabarin, for example, who's now with Ottawa, uh, was on the Heat the entire the entire season on an ATO. He was week to week, game to game contract. Uh, in reality, he could have been let go at any time. Um, and you get that down here, where they'll bring somebody in from college at the end of the year. They'll bring somebody in from Europe for a game or two, let them play, and then say, "Okay, you're done." Uh, so that happens quite a bit as well. Yeah, another big difference in the NHL and the AHL. NHL, you can't just sign a guy to a tryout agreement and ice them in a regular season game. In the AHL, you can. Correct, and and it's last year with all of the defensive uh, problems that the Heat had after after the start with call ups and and people that were hurt. I I think at one point we had. 14 or 15 defensemen who actually played in the game throughout the year. Uh, and some of these guys came in for two years or two games, three games, and then were cut. So also too, is we can borrow a player uh, from an ECHL 
contract uh, to come up. I know uh, John McCarron last year was was with our team for eight or nine games. Who was on? And it doesn't loan. just have to be from Kansas City. It can be from any ECHL team. Yeah, we we picked up somebody from I think it was the Orlando Solar Bears and the Florida Everblades who came up and and played with us for eight or nine games. In fact, Rob Hamilton, who got signed to an AHL contract last year, was with Monarch. Or with uh, Manchester Monarchs. Manchester, yeah. Who was actually a Kings organization uh, who came up on an ATO and then, uh, or a PTO, and conversely got signed to an AHL contract, a two year AHL contract, which, which was great. But you can pull them anywhere. If they're not contracted to a team in, in the ECHL, you can comb that league in the ECHL to try to pull somebody up for a game or two to, to cover your, your injuries. Interesting. So yeah, some things that Flames fans should know about the difference in the leagues there. Uh, a couple of questions I had for you about this season. You guys had Ryan Huska there as a coach for a few years. He's now, as we know, uh, up here in Calgary, got promoted to an assistant coach of the Flames. What are the biggest differences you're knowing, but you're noticing between Huska and Kale McLean and their coaching styles or what they're doing with the team? I Huska was very Ryan Huska was very quiet. Um, he and, and still Kale, is. It still is, and, and Kale's kind of that way. Uh, I noticed that that Kale when when Huska was here, Kale was his defensive coach, and uh, it was kind of it must have really kind of hurt him a little bit last year getting used to the head coaching role to see the defense just really have issues. I, I think he's grown over the over the summer. Uh, he's a little more vocal. I I saw him pretty adamant uh, at a game at a non-call a couple of weeks ago. And and Kale McLean never really comes off the top bench. He 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 usually stays there. But he was giving it to the ref pretty good uh, on a disallowed goal uh, to where they could not review it because the iPad, <laughs> the review iPad, wasn't working. Yes, that actually happens in the AHL. Um, only at the AHL level. <laughs> only the AHL. Um, cost us During a goal. In the AHL, we would probably stop until we got it working. Yeah. So he was pretty adamant. And I haven't seen him that adamant uh, ever uh, in the last two years. Um, he used to bring the blender out a lot last year. He, he used to mix lines a lot where Ryan never really mixed the lines too much. I, I think Kale has gone back to finding the chemistry uh, and making sure the chemistry fits. Um, so he he jumps the gun a little bit. He's quick on a draw for pulling a goalie. He's quick on calling a timeout to change uh, momentum. Those things that those are things that Ryan uh, did not do that often. Uh, I think they have a similar style, uh, but their I think their communication. I think Kale's communication has has grown a lot over the summer, and I think he's I think he's really have driven down the to to all the players the system and how to play the system and what they're going to do in the system and they've got players that buy into that system. Uh, Ryan was a really good coach. I I I liked Ryan. I was happy when he got the promotion. Uh, he he got dealt a couple of bad hands, but I I think he played very well with what he did. It is the life of an HL coach though, right? Absolutely. Um yeah, no, that's that's good. And and Matt and I talked on the show back in oh geez, July at the prospect camp. And they the Flames always let the AHL head coach run that prospect camp. And just we saw a lot of difference between the way Kale ran the on ice and the way Ryan did. And Ryan always it seemed like had more of that defensive first mentality, which is I mean, where he is now with the team, he's the defensive coach where it seemed like Kale had a little bit more of the offensive and the defensive sides together, if that made sense. He had some drills that weren't just about always attacking defensemen and defensemen having to fend them off. There was some purely offensive stuff. And so I was seeing, from my eyes anyway, sort of a better blend of everything from Kale. And, and he does. He runs his, you know, you can't get into practices down here. You can't, you can't attend that. They don't, uh, they don't announce lines. Uh, I, I write them down just to make sure that I keep track of the lines. And um, those are, those are things that I, I like to see. Um, but he, he has, he has settled his lines. He, his defensive uh, mindset has really come into play this year because unlike last year, the forwards are coming back. They're crashing the defensive end. They are getting in the shooting lanes. They're blocking shots. There's a lot more responsibility 
that he's laid on the forwards to come back on the defensive end. And conversely, you've got some demon on this team that are not afraid to jump deep. I see Yellison below the red or below the goal line a lot. Uh, Valiev is always looking for garbage in front. Um, you know, Davidson stays at the point, and I know that he's up with you guys now. But when he was here, he stays at the point. Shillington is is always at the dress circle and, and above, but he still jumps into the to the fray as well. So there's a give and take on both ends uh, where where they are crashing hard. But I think the the biggest difference I've seen since last year uh, to this year is definitely the the buy in of the defensive game on on the forwards part coming back to help out. And that, I mean, when you're explaining that, I'm just thinking, well, yeah, that's NHL hockey. But as you mentioned earlier, that's sometimes where the, the disconnect is, is between getting those guys who are at the AHL level tuned and ready to go and getting their sort of raw talent ready to play at the AHL on both sides of the rink. And you have players in the, in the AHL and, and, you know, not to point out anybody in particular, but, He's no longer here, so I guess I could point him out. Emil Poirier was a guy that hung out. He would share. He'd, he'd be looking for that home run cherry pick pass. He'd, he'd hang out the blue line, and the only time he ever crossed the red line was to go back to the bench. So he's got. There's not players that are on this team that do that any longer. There, everybody comes back. It, it doesn't matter whether your name is Lomberg or or Dubé or or Justin Kirkland, you're back in the defensive end. You are defending those shots against. That's good. Cause that's what they're going to have to do when they get called up. And I think what you mentioned is a big reason why Poirier never really got called up. Yes. Um, last question for you about this year, who would you say, I mean, we can look at the stats and the stats definitely tell part of the story, but looking at the team from your eyes, who would you say the stars are? Let's say two guys from the offense and two guys from the defense. Well, the first guy that, that really stood out to me this year is Glenn Godden. He's, he's bigger, he's bigger coming in the camp and he looks like he's gained 10 or 12 pounds coming in and, and not, not fat, but muscle. He seems to. He seems to be looking at the ice differently. Um, it's almost like the game slowed down in half for him coming into this year from last year. Last year, he, you know, he's a rookie. He's coming into this league. He he got his bell rung a couple of times. This year, um, he is really – he surveys the ice. Uh, I, I know that sounds – kind of weird but you could almost see his head moving back and forth and and if i was going to jump in his head he's probably going okay if i go here i i have about a 40 percent chance of getting this done if i go here he's going to do this like he's thinking the game and it shows up on the on the score sheet and right now he's second on the team in in points Uh, but he he's looking at it he's looking at the game differently than he did last year which is excellent uh, uh, to to look at a future for for this team uh, for the flames uh, the second guy is Ryan Lomberg to me and he's always been a fan favorite in in Stockton he's always the guy that quickly drops his gloves uh, he he but he hasn't done that over the last couple of years he's fast he's even faster than he was last year um he gets he gets under the team. He's Kachuk Jr. As in, he's always picking at the other team, but he's been more, more vocal with the refs during breaks. He's the first guy to come back and, and tap pads to if, if a goal gets scored against us. Um, He really, he really has a step. He's on the first line. Now he is, uh, he's playing, the, he's playing power play for the first time up here. He's been on penalty kill for forever, you know, forever that I've seen him here. Um, but he's he's got a lot more responsibility, and he doesn't just use his speed just to get around people. He uses his speed to get back to break up two on ones. He he really sells out defensively. So, so those he's really are the, more of an agitator than a goon these days. Yeah, I, I think he's gotten two roughing penalties this year. I don't remember him dropping the gloves but once or twice last year um he really has gone out of that role and really has matured as a player 
Yeah, his uh, penalty minutes per game right now stand at 1.08, so definitely not the Ryan Lomberg that a lot of Calgary fans are used to. And um, well, I mean, we've seen Lomberg called up to Calgary a few times over the last few seasons, which surprised a lot of people. But based on what you're saying, it's good to see his change in his game around. And I like your comparison to Mini Kachuk. I mean, that's what Kachuk brings a value up here is that agitation, that sandpaper. And if we can get that at Lomberg, I think it'll be that much more valuable because the game's going away from the goons. And and the one thing with Lomberg, I think, and, and a lot of times what happens when players get called up, and I think this is what's going on in Jankowski's head right now is, you know, Jankowski was a top line center here. He was power play. He was penalty kill. He gets up to Calgary and he's a third or a fourth line center. And I think he's having a hard time adjusting to that because he knew where he was. Lomberg knows that when he goes to Calgary, he's a fourth line winger. That's what he will be. And he relishes the role. And I think that's to have him come into camp or come up to Calgary when he gets called up to have that mindset of knowing, okay, I'm going to get eight game. I'm going to get eight minutes a game, or I'm going to get nine minutes a game. And I'm going to get two or three opportunities to be on the penalty kill. I'm going to make these nine minutes count. I think that's what he he's expecting. He knows he's going to produce in those nine minutes. He won't, he won't short himself in those nine minutes. He he will go all out in those nine minutes uh, when he's on the ice. And I think that's, that's the attitude that, that he has to bring up. And I think that's the attitude he will have up. Uh, he's had it in the past when he's been called up for a game or two. I think he's really worth a look on the fourth line up there. Yeah. I think that's a great thing to point out is, you know, guys like Jankowski, he was a top guy in college, top guy in the A, used to playing a lot of minutes. Like you said, when you're now relegated to seven, eight minutes a game, you don't really know how to play your game. You're used to having multiple cracks of things and, you know, many shifts and a guy like Lomberg who hasn't always been that, who's, you know, knows how to play his game in eight minutes. That's kind of what you need to look at when you're moving guys up the lineup too. It's not always the best guy or the guy with the most points you want to recall. Sometimes it's the guy who knows how to play the role you're looking for that recall to play in. Right. And, and he, he knows his role and, and he reminds me a little bit like Hathaway as well. Hathaway knew his role down here. Um, and he has that little grit to him, but I, I think Lomberg is just, he's faster than Hathaway. I think he's a little smarter uh, hockey IQ wise uh, but he's doing something this year that he hasn't done in the past, and I don't think he's really been given the opportunity to, and that is the fact that he's been playing in front of the net. He's – he, yeah, he's small. I get it. But, you know, you just need to block that goalie's view just for a split second for that puck to go by, and he's been he's been front of the net much more. He's not allergic to that blue paint in front of the goalie. And sometimes the best forwards are not necessarily the ones that are – um, you know, putting the puck in the net. But like you said, the guy who's screening, the guy who's making it possible for the other forwards to score. And Lomberg's been rewarded for it too. He's got 11 points so far, tied for fifth most on the team. It's, he's just, you can see when he gets on the ice, he's happy. He's joking around with the other players during during breaks, just kind of jabbing at him. He's, he's talking to the refs more, which last year you would never have saw that. Um, he, he really is he's really trying to, to es- escalate his game. And I think, I think right now it's shown uh, he's, I say he's got more maturity from last year. He was, he was good last year. I, I he's even better this year. And that's what you want to see at the HL level. Those guys need to get progressively better little by little every year. What about on the blue line, Jeff? Uh, who are we seeing that's really stand out on the blue line this year? As you mentioned, a lot of blue line woes this year, but a lot better looking blue line, at least on paper this season. Excuse me. I think, well, Rene Valiev and, and Alexander Yeltsin, both of those guys, they're good right now. They're on the second line. Uh, Kale McLean put those together. I think they can use, uh, I think it makes uh, Valiev a little more comfortable. He has a Russian next to him. They can communicate uh, a lot better. Uh, I sat at a table last year with Valiev for the, the season ticket, uh, ticket, uh, season ticket barbecue. And, you could tell he felt a little out of place because he was really only the only Russian that was on the team. There's a, a few other you know, Swedes and stuff, but um, does he struggle with English? Not, no. He's actually gotten a lot better over over last year. Uh, throughout the year, uh, he's learning it very well. But to have somebody from Russia on your on your on your wing or on your side, you know, as your pair, mm-hmm. it, it's really done. It, it really has helped them out. 
a lot. I I like those two. I think Yellison is still getting used to the North American game a little bit. Um, hasn't put up a, a lot of numbers. I mean, only two points, a goal and an assist. But he's played well. He's played steady. He the the overtime loss last week uh, to Tucson. He had a chance to clear on a four on three, and he let the puck bobble on his stick for about three or four times, and really just handed it to the to the road runner uh, forward who made a beautiful pass across the middle and and beat Zagadulin for a wide open net. But I, I could have scored that goal, and I don't I don't I don't, I don't lace up skates. So, um, but that's a solid second pair. They're they're not flashy. They're they're not. Um, they're not out of position a lot. Those two, Yellison is going to need a full year down here. I know a lot of people always want to try to pull people up and, and look at it. He needs a full year down here. That's not just because I'm selfish and want to see him play all year, which I do, but I want to see him grow and I want to see him be able to be established. Uh, again, he's not playing top line minutes. You, a couple other guys, Davison, you've already got him up there. Shillington came down and scored a hat trick in his in his second game, uh, but he was a minus two for that game. Uh, it's tough to do. That That is. I, it is. I, I kind of looked at that. It is. Um, the one guy that I really like, um, and he's playing third pair right now, and and that's Zach Leslie. Zach Leslie was with, uh, with Chicago Wolves last year in the Vegas organization, uh, helped that team get to a Calder Cup final. Just a steady guy. It, he's actually putting up a little more points this year than he does at this time of the year. He's got seven points. He's got two goals and five assists right now through 11 games. He's just a steady defenseman. He's, he's not going to get beat very often. Uh, He's a plus four on the year. He just really, he has a calming effect to, I think he's a guy that has some experience, uh, a guy that's had some experience playing in the playoffs uh, both Calder Cup, well, in the Calder Cup playoffs, I think he brings that sense of, okay, don't don't panic. We've been here. We know what we can do. We we can we can move out of this. Rob Hamilton, solid AHL guy, uh, still growing a little bit. The um, Corey Schuman's on an AHL contract. Andrew Nielsen, Andrew Nielsen is a is an interesting guy. He's a guy this organization likes, and we've talked to the the GM uh, here in Calgary, Tree Living, about him at uh, prospect camps and stuff. But I think he's got a long way to go. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, he does. Although I will say, uh, in the preseason game that we went to Bakersfield with, with um, and and they dressed a lot of PTOs and ATOs down there, and he was one of the guys that was that that dressed for that game. He really kind of stepped up and took a leadership role. He was pointing at people, moving people, positioning people. Uh, he was the guy that was making all the calls. There was there was no letters at that point uh, issued out. Now, in in the in the, in the AHL, when, I mean in in the regular season, he has been playing with Davidson on that top pairing. Uh, he he really has. Davidson has been a really good influence on him. He'll throw the body around. He won't drop the mitts, but he'll throw the body around. Uh, he'll move people away. He he still needs time. He still needs seasoning. But he is he is so much better than he was last year. Last year, when he came over from Toronto, it just seemed like he was uninterested in playing, which really – I had heard so much about him and it really was disappointing uh, to see that kind of play. It just seemed like he didn't want to be here this year. Completely different person, very engaged, very um, really conscious about his positioning. He's working on his positioning. So he is growing. And again, do we, you know, does the, do the flames call him up? No, they don't. Um, is he a guy that that is still worth the investment? Absolutely, he is. From what I've seen of him, he looks like a guy who's worth keeping around on your AHL roster to help you know steady a blue line. I don't think he's got much upside from what I've seen, probably in the NHL or outside of the AHL. But you know, there's always those guys. I mean, we had guys I can remember back when I was a kid, Carson German, who was on our AHL team for years and years and years, and they're they're worth keeping around just to fill that veteran role. Well, I mean, he's, he's what, 23. 
Uh, he's he's still learning the game. And I know that's kind of odd to say that about a 23-year-old who's been around the AHL for a couple of years and in, in a couple of different organizations. But this is really – he looks different this year. He's still got that baby face. Uh, he's like the baby face assassin, right? But he – He's really matured since last year. And I, I think having Davidson as his partner this year really helps. He was playing third pair last year, and the the bottom pair for last year was was a merry-go-round. It was it was let's pull a name out of the hat and see who we have. Um I don't think the same pair uh stayed on the bottom pair at all. It was I say it was a it was a rotating field. He finally has somebody who he can be teamed with, and now it's going to be different because he's with um, – actually on Saturday, I think, or on – he didn't play Saturday. On Friday, he – Shillington now? No, actually Shillington was with uh, – Shillington was with um, – with, uh, Shillington was with Hamilton. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, he played with Zach Leslie on, on, on Friday, and then he didn't dress on Saturday. Um, I, I missed part of the game on TV uh, on Friday from from Tucson, so I didn't see if he got hurt um, or not. But he he's he needs that veteran um, he needs that veteran presence, and I think with um, with having somebody who is somebody who has been around who can help him guide him through a uh, Davidson, a Zach Leslie, uh, even a Shillington for that matter. Uh, I can see that I can see him being that way. So uh, he needs that experience. Any other big differences you wanted to mention about uh, the difference between this year's team and last year's team? You started talking about some earlier, mostly around showing up the defense, but any other big differences you see between this year's version of heat and last year's? Well, I think the goaltending is better. And I, it, that has a lot of, a, uh, that has a lot to do with the defense in front of you, the play in front of you. Uh, but but Gillies has Gillies has gotten better. I think Zagadulin looks good. Uh, still getting used to the North American game. Um, Schneider when he's when he was here for the one game that he was in looked good. Uh, haven't seen Parsons all year. He's week to week. And uh, what is the injury with Tyler Parsons? Last I heard, upper body. Uh, saw him saw him at the last game signing autographs. And it was just upper body is all he would say. So, I, so let, let's talk goalies here. If you don't mind, Jeff, I have no problem. Um, last year, Calgary flames fans really passionate about seeing Tyler Parsons down there and him turning pro and you know, all that, but you know, as good as Parsons has looked since he's been pro, um, he's been hurt so much. And same thing with John Gillies, like both guys just get hurt so much that it, the question in my mind is would either of these guys, do we think be able to become NHL regulars when they're hurt so much? And this year we've seen uh Zaga Doolin down there looking great. The flames brought him in. A lot of people up here thinking he could be the next David Riddick, that unknown, you know, European goalie coming over. So let's break these down uh piece by piece. Let's talk about Gillies and Parsons first. As so, you mentioned, Par- Parsons, we haven't seen yet. Gillies looks healthy this year. Um, what do you think? What What's the projection for you on both those guys? So I have not been the biggest John Gillies fan ever. And, and for those who have ever read article, my articles on that, um, I, I have not, I have not had confidence in John Gillies. I will say my mind is starting to change. I, I can eat crow with the best of them. Just because um, he's playing a full season, you're seeing more of him. Well, since last February. So the one thing with John Gillies that that I always see and my wife points it out is if he gives up a goal, if he gives up a goal within the next two minutes of that goal, we're going to have a long night at Stockton Arena watching them play. It, it's almost as if that second goal goes in, his whole demeanor kind of drops. This year, completely different. Um and this goes back to February of last year. He he kind of kicked himself for having a bad game after beating Colorado 6-2. Yes, he had a bad game according to him. And he really has changed his approach. 
he used to be, and I called him the smallest six foot six goalie in the league because he's always on his knees. He's always down. He plays really small and he being six, six, it's hard for him to get back up. So when he's down, he gets beat top side, specifically glove side, top side a lot. My nickname used to be glove side high for him. Since about the middle of February of last year, he's playing a different style. Now, I don't know if he's going back to the style he played when he was in college or in juniors, but he is he's standing up more. He is at the top of his crease more. He's going out to challenge his his shooters more. Uh, I, I did a little research. Um, he is since last February and including this year, he's 12, six and three with a nine fifteen save percentage and a 2.5 goals against good numbers for the A great numbers for the A considering he is, he was over three as a career um, going, you know, coming into this year. So he's really worked on his game. He is controlling his rebounds a lot better the one thing I was always one of my knocks on him is he gave up these big juicy rebounds and, and he used to kick in front a lot. And my adage is you can make the first day. You should make the first save. The second save, you really, depending upon where it is, you're a 50, 50 shot on it. And the problem was, is the defense wasn't clearing out enough to where he would kick a puck directly in front of him. And there'd be nobody around and he have an open cage to put, the, you know, to put the puck in the net this year, when he does kick, he kicks sideways. He, he kicks left and right, but he also controls his rebounds a heck of a lot better than he has uh, ever in the past. He's not giving up a lot of second chances. And, and I attribute to that to you know, both the offense and defense uh, coming down to help out. But I also attribute that to him looking at the puck better. Uh, finding it and tracking it better. He, he should have really got a tripping penalty last game in Tucson because he really <laughs> he moved somebody out of his out of his crease, and I had never seen that before from John Gillies. So, if somebody went down in Calgary, whether it's Talbot or or Riddich, bring him up for a week or two and spot filling for a couple of games. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. There was a lot of fans coming into this season who thought that he should be the backup and maybe they shouldn't have brought Talbot in because of him. But to me, he hasn't shown yet up till what you're saying this season that he's NHL ready. I, I agree with you. Uh, last year, he was not NHL ready in the season, uh, in the off season. Uh, you know, there was a lot of speculation that he was going to be on the block and, and part of some sort of trade if, if it happened. Uh, I still think he's a valuable trade piece for the Flames if they need to make a trade. I, and I think he is as well. I, I think the numbers that he's putting up now, he's he's playing right now to tell the Flames, I'm good enough to re-sign. I, I think, is there a spot in the organization? I mean, Talbot's signed on a one-year deal. It I could, think really Gillies has got to show he's good enough to take Talbot's job next year. Gillies this year to me has to go something like 20 and 10 and he has to keep his goals against to 2.5, 2.6. And he needs a save percentage in the, in the teens, in the nine teens. Um, if, if he's anywhere around nine, nine point two, nine Oh four, they don't resign him. If his goals against shoot up, uh, and he's sitting somewhere around 2.98 to three. I, I don't think they resign him, but if he comes in and, and absolutely continues the streak that he's on right now and, and shuts him down, I, I think, I think there's a chance that they sign him to another one year deal. Yeah. I, th- I think, I mean, he's what 25 now. So I think you're kind of at the age where you've either got to be promoted or they got to move on from him. And somebody's told me one time that goalies are voodoo. So Matt says that all the time yeah. too. If if you're gonna trade him, he better be to the East Coast so that you don't have to face him but twice a year in the NHL or in a Calder Cup final if you get there in the AHL. 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying he would be the guy, but in two years with Seattle coming, we're going to need to find, you know, 23 more NHL players because of that. And I wouldn't be surprised if give Gillies a backup job somewhere, uh, you know, with the way an expansion draft could shake down. I wouldn't be surprised if he could work his way into an NHL job somewhere. Uh, He probably can. And I think he has the mindset to do it, or I think he has the ability to do it. I think he's got the skills to do it. I think it's his mindset. And sometimes he gets into his own head. We we saw a game in preseason. Now, this is a preseason game where he allowed uh, the third goal coming in. It was the third goal. And he almost, and I don't want to call it a temper tantrum, he was l- seriously ticked off at himself and he's banging his stick on the, on the ice and he's down on all fours. And you could tell that he was really mad at himself. And, and it's stuff that like, like that you're he's, he's got to be thinking, I should have had that. I know I can make that stop. I make that stop 99% of the time, but he, that was an emotion that I saw broken out that again, you can't catch in a box score or on a highlight reel that really, to me set his his year in in motion and he was hurt uh for the first couple of weeks and since he's come back he's really been good and and that again i I am not the biggest john gillies fan uh but he has been really good and if this john gillies is the same john gillies that's going to take us the rest of the year we will be let's talk about the other man tending the twine for for stockton this year and that's uh, Zagadulin. Zagadulin came over. This is his first pro year. A um, lot of lot of hype from him up here in Calgary. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of people comparing him to maybe David Riddick. What are you seeing with Zagadulin? So Zagadulin, to me, he started off really good. Um, his biggest problem was he used to give up goals late in the third period. Uh, his first two goals, he he carried shutouts into into the third period and. And with 10 minutes left, he gives up a goal. And then four minutes later, he gives up another goal. And one of them was a garbage goal. I'm not going to blame him for that. Uh, since then, he's kind of progressed backwards a little bit. Um, I don't think he's allowed. Wow. I think he's allowed three or more in everything that he's been in. The overtime loss that he had, uh, obviously, as I, as I said earlier, with, with God, should not have been his yeah, loss. Yeah, it's just a in North weird. American hockey. But – I, I think he's. I think it's an adjustment. I think there probably still is a language issue there. When when the team came out for um, for the preseason autograph sessions, he wasn't there. Actually, it was interesting. Him and Yellison and Valiev, all three weren't there. Which hmm, the Russian connection didn't show. But I think it's the fact that he's still just not comfortable. Um, you know, because he doesn't. When he speak was the here language. in July for rookie, I, I don't know. I've never had spoken to, have a to translator the man. I, I he didn't speak. I don't think a word of English. Yeah, so I, I think that's part of it. I think having Valiev and the Ellison on the team help him out a lot, but I think he's still getting used to the North American game. I think he's still getting used to the speed. He's quick. He, he he's he's a butterfly uh, goalie. He goes down. In fact, I've got a beautiful picture of him in the butterfly. Uh, oh, I should say my wife took the picture. I can't take that credit. Um, but he's fast to his feet. He reminds me of Riddich in the fact that he's very active. Um, he will, he will move the puck. He, where Gillies doesn't, Gillies will freeze the puck. Zagadu will European. move the puck out of the way. It, it'll move the puck up. Um, it is. And, and I think he's, he, again, he's a guy that, if they, if the Flames call him up for some reason this year, I think it would do a disservice. Yeah, and I think that's his, a good thing to find out. A lot of Flames America. fans up here always just want to see the next guy and see the next guy, and you know, let's bring him up so we can see him. But you know, the the AHL exists for a reason, and a lot of times the best thing we can do for these guys is leave them in the AHL because they need that development time, and not just on the ice, but it's the routine, right? When you go to Calgary, you got a new routine, new team. You know, sometimes the best thing to do is keep you in a in a I guess, familiar environment to develop better. And I think he's definitely one of those guys. I would rather call Gillies up than I would uh, Zagadulin this year. Yeah. And, and the one thing with the AHL, it, it, this is a weekend league, you know, you, you do have the occasional Wednesday afternoons, but it's pretty much a Wednesday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday league. You're playing back to backs on a weekend. 
the you know the the road trip that's coming up you 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 take a bus four hours down to Bakersfield and you're back that night you you take the bus to San Jose and back you you take the bus to Ontario and then you go to to San Diego and you fly home after that you, you're home in Stockton for the majority of the week the, the Heat played today uh, a six three win over the red hot uh, San Diego goals woohoo um, but they won't be on the ice again until till Friday night. So you have that much downtime. You get an hour or you get two hours of, of practice time. There are some team functions that you do, um, you know, the community stuff that that needs to be done. But overall, you've got a lot of downtime. Well, a lot of that in the NHL, you're city to city to city. You're every other game. Correct. And – and you get an hour, maybe two hours of practice time down here, and that's all you usually get during a day. Um, so, and and like today, they played they played Saturday night in in Tucson. Uh, they flew home on Sunday, and then they had a one o'clock game today. So there was no practice time in there. I don't think there was a skate on Sunday. Again, I, we don't get the skate schedules like you guys do in NHL. You guys are spoiled. <laughs> so, um, but but you do. Um, I think a lot of that downtime, he's he's getting to learn the language. He's getting to learn the area. He's getting to learn the North America game. He's seeing more film. I I don't have an issue with him. I shouldn't say an issue with him. That sounds really bad. Like I'm the coach or something. I, I think he he is he's going to have his his learning curve. He's only going to get better. Uh, he is a guy, and I think this is where him and John Gillies are good for each other. They push each other. And I think Gillies is much better when he's being pushed. And I think Zagadulin now thrives the role that he wants to take the net and they're sharing the net. You know, and goalies often do better when there's somebody to push them. And I'm wondering, maybe that's what, what you're seeing from Gillies as well is just having, you know, a legitimate number two who could become the number one in Zagadulin. I wonder if that's motivating Gillies. And you have, um, but that's the big thing. You have when he's Parsons, around, when he's, he's healthy, he's been hurt more than but, he's been active in his age since he turned pro. And and when Parsons is healthy, it's been when Gillies has been up, you know, as a backup with the Flames. So overall, I I think, I I think the fact that you have two healthy goalies who are coming in, and and this even goes back to Schneider because I think, I think Schneider has. Um, I think Schneider does have a future, by the way. Um, it may top out at the I AHL. think especially with this depth chart, I, I though, I'm not sure his future. future will be as a Calgary Flames goalie, even if he is NHL caliber. For well, sure. And I I think he could be a Stockton Heat goalie for a long time. I think he'd make a pretty good living on it. Um, I, I think personally, and you asked me about Tyler Parsons earlier, it, it's so hard because there are days that I mean, he still holds the record for the Heat for, what, 52 saves in a game? I mean, they threw stuff at him left and right. I was there for his for his first win in San Jose. When he's on, man, he's on, and it's hard. My thing with, with, with Parsons is he relies, at least last year, and I haven't seen him this year, obviously, but last year he relies on his glove a lot. He will come across his body to try to glove a puck as opposed to sticking away or using as a blocker. Uh, and, and he's missed, he's missed shots because of that. Um, he's a guy that likes to make that leather flash save. And it just, he's got to learn that he's got other equipment to allow him to, to save. He's another guy that fights, in my opinion, he fights self-confidence, um, with the fact that he lets in a bad goal and it gets in his head. And, and then all of a sudden you turn around five. Well, minutes and that's later why these guys are down, down a another. dev league to learn how to work through some of so, that. Cause a lot of them didn't have those same kind of challenges in juniors. And that's the big challenge when you move up to the HL level. And, and you were saying earlier about Seattle coming in and, and, and grabbing a goalie. I, I could actually see them take Parsons over Gillies. I think if they were going to take one of our goalies, I definitely agree with Parsons. But I think, you know, you could see him take a goalie from another team and then uh, Gillies backfills a backup for somebody else. I I can see that. And and I I definitely can see that. But I can see – I'm not – I'm not 
completely sold on Tyler Parsons and what what he can bring to this. He, he, obviously, he hasn't shown that much because he's always been hurt. But I I would not be surprised that once he gets off of his upper body week to week, and when you're saying week to week, that tells me concussion or um, I'm speculating. And that's my only guess. I can see them assigning him to Kansas City to get ice time because right now there's not enough ice time in Stockton between Gillies and Zagadulin and the way those two are playing. I cannot see Parsons breaking that duo. Yeah, that makes I can sense. See Parsons and, you know, at Kansas least City. go down there and get your confidence up before we find an AHL spot for you, whether that's in Stockton or loan him out somewhere else. But, you know, especially Correct. when he's been hurt pretty much all season, you got to get that rust off. Well, let's uh, jump ahead a little bit here. We had a fan question from one of our fans on Twitter. We asked everyone to submit questions for Jeff. And uh, Rene Couture, at Rain underscore Couture on Twitter, asked us, does Godden have the potential to be an impact player? And he said third or second line guy for the Flames. I imagine he doesn't mean this year, but going forward. So, Jeff, you've had a better look at uh, Godden than we have. What do you think? Well, as I stated like earlier in the show regarding him, he's one of the two guys that really kind of stand out for me uh, from last year to this year. He does. He has that potential to be, in my opinion, to come up as a third line center uh, to start with. Uh, he he has a little bit of physicality to him. He's not afraid to jump in and move some people around. Uh, he he looks and and has a pretty good shot, but he also uh, he he looks beyond just the initial pass. Uh, my only complaint, if I had a complaint, would be, and, and it's with this entire team, they love the east-west rinkside pass. Um, but that's just something that's kind of a team culture for the last five years, it seems like. I, I think he does. I think he needs another full year down here because I think he wants to – I think Kale and everybody else would want him to be able to experience the entire year He's teamed with Matthew Phillips. Uh, the, that duo has not been broken up since uh, since they came into the league together last year. I think those two play off of each other very well. Uh, you need to be able to have somebody with speed. You couldn't put him with a Lucic uh, because it would just drag him down. Um, I don't think you could – you would need somebody who has some speed – uh, he's played with Quine before, but I, I don't think that's a good um, I don't think that's a good matchup with him. You know, a, a Ryan, somebody like uh, a Ryan or or um, or Manjapani, I think they would they would click pretty well together um, because he need he needs somebody with speed. So, uh, does he have a future with the Flames? Absolutely. Um, I think I don't he might get a look year, this but year, I think but I don't think there's – even if we look at the uh, roster, I think there's room up. for him as a full-time Flame this year. I I hope – and I'm going to be selfish here for, for a second here. I hope for the heat's sake that the Flames don't pull him up with three weeks left in the season and we're fighting for a playoff spot. I, I hope that they allow these players down here to experience playoff hockey so that they can bring that playoff hockey experience up to Calgary when they go there next year. If, if the if the Heat are out of it, if the Flames are out of it, um, I would rather see them keep uh, the 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 development in place down here to let them. Obviously, if the Flames need help, he's going to be one of the guys that gets called up. And I and I know that as an AHL That's gotta fan, that's going to be the hard thing to be an AHL fan. Like you know, you know that. that they're going up to uh, help another team, but you lose some of your best players. Two years ago, when the Flames were kind of out of the playoffs, they brought Spencer Fu up, and say what you will about Spencer Fu, but the Heat were, I think, at that time tied for fourth, and and were challenging for a playoff spot. And you took a guy who was third on your team at that point, or fourth on your team at that point in in points, and you yank him out of your lineup, and you put a bunch of ATOs and PTOs in there. And we missed the playoffs by – actually, we missed the playoffs on the last game. If we would have beat San Jose that game, we would have actually got the fourth spot. So it is it is disheartening when that happens, especially when you're pulling them up for a look. Um, but I understand as being an AHL fan and a fan of the Heat that that's our job. Our job is to supply the Parrot Club. 
and we have to do everything to make these these players ready to step into a flames uniform and and you know present or to you know to make the flames better um i think in some cases a few players uh, got pulled up a little too fast it didn't allow them to develop that i think they would have been better uh spending a year or or so down here or, you know three quarters of the year down here but i think i know that that's what that expectation is i also do think that a playoff run a deep playoff run in a Calder cup uh playoff in in the ahl also is part of the development of a player because they get used to playing playoff hockey. And I think that is some valuable lessons that you cannot teach or show somebody on video. I think to be able to experience, to win a round, this team has never won a round of of playoffs in the five years that it's been here. Uh, We came really close uh, one year, but we've only made the playoffs one year. And it it is a little disheartening to, uh, to see players go up, but in the, in the you know, on the other hand, yeah, you, you can't you, you do can't know fall that that's in love the with a guy there like you can in the NHL where you go, okay, we signed Kachuk, we signed him to a long term deal, he's probably gonna be here. You never know, I mean, tomorrow which guys are gonna be there anymore. And and it happens, I mean, fifty, sixty, seventy percent of these players that are on the team today uh for the Heat weren't here last year. You know, Brian Fraze wasn't here. Justin Kirkland wasn't here. Brandon Davidson wasn't here. Zach Schilling Leslie wasn't, wasn't here. here. You know, E.T. Tudola wasn't here. He's, you know, I mean, Shillington wasn't here. Well, he was here at the beginning of the year. Um, but you have players that are down here that were with other clubs and not just rookies and not just, just uh, you know, signed players that have come up through through the draft or through, you know, player, uh, player contracts. But you've got guys coming in uh, that that were with other teams. So, it's funny walking around an AHL team, especially uh, at the Heat. I, wow, I've got a hundred name I haven't heard for a while. Jersey in my in my closet, <laughs> who's now in Carolina. Um, um, so I, you see that I always call it the ghost of players past, um, because with the AHL you do get you know jersey auctions and and you know meet the player. And, but yeah, it's it's you see the ghost field. Jeff, players uh, pass in wrapping up flicks, here, yeah. if you were going to give us, I mean, we can always look at stats and stuff like that to say who the Flames should call up. But if you had to answer that call from Troll Living to say, hey, we need a guy brought up to Calgary, who would be the first guys you'd be recommending the Flames look at bringing up right now if they needed somebody? Let's start with um, the forwards. So are we looking offense, defense, both? Buddy Robinson does nothing but score goals here. He's got eight goals uh, in, in third overall on the team for points. He's a right shot. Um, not and and again, he's not going to get you in trouble. It, again, big kid doesn't mind getting in front of the paint. If you're looking to if you're looking to do to fill that right side, Robinson's a pretty good choice. He's got a little more experience than Phillips. Yeah, Phillips leads the team right now in points with fifteen. A goal and four assists today, by Phillips the way. Phillips is at that uh, age where for, I think he's going to be better else. staying in the AHL so, than getting moved up and down between the NHL and Stockton. Yeah, it, bringing him up hurts his hurts his development. Um, a guy that I haven't talked about a whole lot uh, right now that I, I think is actually would be able to give a pretty good kick, Justin Kirkland. He's just quiet. He's He plays a quiet game. Um, Again, 11, 11 points on the season. He's a minus four, which I, I'm not too happy about. But he's just there. He's steady. He is a guy that you can count on being able to, to be there, to be in the position. And then, and then Ryan Lomberg. I would pull Ryan Lomberg up just for the energy, just for the skating ability, just for the fourth line um, and for so the our fans kill, would, uh, I, I would, I would, would bring kill up us if we didn't ask because a lot of people here love him. Why is Dylan Dubé not on that list for you? Do you think he's like Phillips where he just so needs some I, seasoning time? He needs time. He was a guy, and he's one of the two guys that I think should have started last year in the AHL. He needs a 
full year to to be able to refine his game. This year so far, I've seen him on five, six, seven breakaways and not been able to bury the puck. Uh, and I know you're not going to bury the puck every single time, but there's there's a there's a chance. I mean, there's a, a thing where you have a good shot and, and, and the goalie makes a good save or you're picking a spot and you just happen to miss it. He's missed the net five, six feet wide. He's throwing the puck right into right into the check. Now, he has righted his game a lot over the last three, four, five games. Um, but I think he is still searching. He is He's still looking for how to refine his game. I think, quite frankly, either a full year or at least a half a year down here, he needs some consistency and he needs ice time and he's not going to get 15 minutes. To me, he's like Phillips and Godden where, you know what, the best thing for them right now is just to play in the AHL and play AHL minutes on a consistent basis. And those three on the line were fun to watch. They're really fun to watch. Um, And, and actually recently, they've moved Dubé to a center position for a couple of games. Uh, he centered Kirkland and uh, uh, was it? Uh, it may have been uh, Zach Ronaldo. So it, it's. Um, and how about on the back end? It's to see how they need move a, players. A defenseman, around. obviously Brandon Davidson was the first call up, but outside him, who would you be suggesting they call up? If, if you're going to look for a strict defensive guy, that's going to man the blue line. Uh, Rene Valiev. I think his game is is just so steady and so quiet. It's quieted down this year. He's not going to dazzle you with a lot of points. He's not going to dazzle you with the with the big bomb. He's got a bomb. He's got a good shot. He just doesn't take it. Um, he he will be your third line, ten minute. I'm not going to let anybody get by me. Is he going to drop the, the gloves? No, he doesn't. But he's he, to me, he is pretty steady i don't like his penalty minutes because sometimes he he takes that lazy hook or he takes that that lazy slash um but overall he's he's been pretty solid i I think that trade for kulak when we got him and tara taramina who i don't know where taramina is these days but i think this kid actually has a lot of potential i think he is a guy that can he can he can be that six seven to start with and i think as he gets more time um, he's a guy that I think really is going to be a, a, a good player. He, he definitely will be a, a top line or second line uh, defenseman in the AHL. I think he'll be a good me six, if, seven if up. you think this assessment's incorrect, I think with uh, Valley of this year, if we see him for 10 games during the season up here, probably, you know, wouldn't hurt if he's playing more than that. It probably means that we need to go and get a, an NHL ready defenseman. I agreed with that. I, I completely agree with that. He he's the guy that's going to give you he, to me, a game like the or guy two. You bring on the road he's when you've got a long road trip. To... Just you've got an extra defenseman. If you got to throw him in one or two, no big deal. But I wouldn't be surprised if they did that. And he's the guy that I don't think I I don't think he would be surprised. I don't think the team would be surprised uh, surprised by that. Shillington is always going to be that flair. I I just wish at some point they would have actually tr- taken. They would have done. They would have Brett Burns him, right? Bring him to forward and let him play. See, I, he's got wheels. I joke with Matt about this every year. Every year, Matt well. wants to convert one of our defensemen to forwards. And this year, he said Shillington. He's I just correct. think, though, in this team, I, I, we've got so few ready defensemen. You've got to keep him on defense. He is. I joked when I said one time the words Shillington and defense shouldn't be used in the same sentence. Um, I. He was a minus 12 in, in 15, 16. He was a minus 15, 17, 18. He's not going to – and again, he's got three goals, and he's a minus two this year in two games, uh, oh, three games. Um, so it's not like he's going to set the world on fire and and block a whole lot of shots and, and man that blue line. I mean, well, I think if you can pair a guy that, like that with a more defensively big. responsible defenseman, uh, you can get a good pairing out of it. Well, and Anderson – Anderson makes people look good. And I know his pairings up there has been with Anderson on the third line a lot. And and Anderson will, and by the way, I was so blessed to watch that kid play down here. It was amazing. Um, 
he, he did things down here that I, I hope that as his confidence and his time gets, gets more in Calgary that he shows. Cause he's a guy that's got a bomb of a shot. He knows how to quarterback stuff on a, on a power play. And he's just got, he's got grit to him as well. He's, I mean, he's I'd at loved a point where, him. and even it's Matt just, and I discussed it, but a lot uh, of fans up here in the offseason said, can we afford to move Brody and use him and use Anderson on the number one pairing? He's the guy that I think in a few years could and, actually And I think this year with both Brody it. and Hamannick having uh, contracts up, and I think, you know, it's going to make some tough decisions is why bring one of them back and not Anderson for the same money. Yeah, he's... He really has a long future in Calgary, and I think uh, Calgary would be um, – they would be wise to lock him up. to. A now it looks like a shock that he dropped to the second round in his draft class. It, I know. It, it, it's amazing that he was still there. He's just such – he's a nice guy. Talked to him a few times. I actually won his, his jersey off the, off the back a couple of years ago. Um, Good kid. Had, had some time to yeah, chat Matt with and I have chatted with he him just, a few times at he's a nice uh, rookie guy. camp. I've talked to him a few times in the room after games. Good kid. I mean, you can tell he wants to be playing hockey. Yes, and and he enjoys playing hockey, and and that's that's one thing. And and I'll jump at Jankowski right now just because I watched him come up. It just seems to me on 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 TV, it's like he is not enjoying the game where other players like. Anderson and Lomberg, they enjoy playing. And, and I, I think you've got to really enjoy what you're doing in order to get the most out of it. And I think right now he's a guy that is just trying to keep his job as opposed to this getting out of his head and just playing. Just don't Janko. Don't think just, just play. Uh, The old guy I think could use some more HL seasoning. And, And I think, He's the kind of guy I think needed to. I, I'm not too sure about that. He, you know, I mean, there's some there's some I'll guys like um, Anderson moment, who we just would... talked about who you can bring up and sort of let them develop a little bit at the NHL level. It's sort of like when you take your steak out early and let it cook itself on the hot pan. But there's there's other guys like Janko and I think even guys like Bennett who we might have been better to over ripen in the AHL than pull them up early. I, I agree with you with the Bennett. I think, uh, I think Bennett, I think watching last year, watching, um, watching Curtis Lazar last year, who First just guy ever so to much to be fun sent to playing the down here. I think. Yeah. And, and he really should have worn the C last year uh, for, for, Cal, or for Stockton. And unfortunately, Kale did not issue a C to anybody last year. And I think that's, a big difference in last year's team to this year's team as well is we have a captain, we have ultimates. It's not a rotating alternate captain. Yeah. So I I think Curtis Lazar is a guy that could have spent a lot of time at the, at the beginning of his career uh, in the A and really learned. I I, I think Valimaki is the same way. I I think you saw that. I I don't disagree with you. I think he was tired too early. And I'm hoping that when he comes back from his injury this year, they send him down to Stockton to work off the rust. And I hope he stays there for the year. The, the, the 15 or 20 games that he was down here, he really, he really showed that, that he knows how to play the game. I just think he needs to get used to the game and get used to the pro game. I, I I am still a firm believer that an 18 year old, unless you're uh, Matthew Kachuk, unless you're a Jack Hughes, uh, unless you're a Kako Kapo, who 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 are the top of those list, uh, uh, top of the draft list that can come in, you really need a year. Being 18, you really need a year of pro hockey to find out what it's all about, how to interact with the fans, how to how the the game is played and the structure. Uh, well, you know, I, I've said on the show too, I think the teams that are bringing way too many um, guys up every year, it's because they don't have any depth. And I think the fact that you have to leave guys in the HL or make those decisions who to leave there means you've got the depth. You know, you look at a team like Calgary, they could afford, if you will, to send Dubay down, to keep Godden down there. Like, I, I think you, when you see organizations pulling, you know, seven, eight guys out of the HL, not many teams have seven, eight guys that are ready. A lot of times it's, we just need some bodies. For sure, and sometimes that hurts the development. I know that that I know that you in need the modern NHL, especially that, with the cap, you need era. to be able to. 
Yeah, you need that person to fill in. But I think if you're looking for an 18, 19, 20-year-old who was a third-round draft pick to come in and center your second line, there's an issue. There's an issue with your team and your – I mean, it, it, you're not Ottawa. You know, and and good thing, you know, good for Ottawa. I saw them play Vegas earlier this year where they took them to a shootout, which, um, which was kind of cool. But you know, you, you kind of take those those kids are playing for a job, they're playing for a future, they're playing to to make themselves better, and and it was fun to see that. And and that's going to be a scary team in three four years when when they all come and mature together. That Ottawa team is going to be. Thomas Shabbat and and uh, and Branstrom in the back end. That's that's going to be a team to watch out for. But they still got three years to do that. Would that team be a hell of a lot better if if all of them had a year or sure. two in the A? Well, Jeff, I think that's oh, yeah. it for uh, this chat that we're going to have. Why don't you let people know where they can find you if they want to find more about the Heat until we talk next? So I do write for Flames Nation under the pseudonym of Stockton's Finest. You can read out. I have an article coming out this week, uh, mid-November report. Uh, I usually on those reports kind of do some stats, give you where the heat stand, what they've done, what they're looking at. And then I, I do a little personalized eye test. Sometimes stats and, and a four-minute video highlight can, can only tell so much. Um, so I, I kind of bring something to my articles that unless you're in Stockton arena and can see it, that you're not going to see, uh, we do some, I do some recaps on some cha- uh, chalk talks with the, the coaches when they, when they host those. For, and how often uh, do you put those articles out? Uh, season ticket holders, uh, uh, usually every week or every other week, depending upon the heat schedule. I know that, uh, I will, I, I have one coming out this week. Uh, I'm planning to put one out next week, but then the Heat are on the road for the remainder of November, so it'll probably be December before I throw my third one out there. But roughly, it's usually every week, every cool. Every well, thanks 10 for joining us, Jeff. We'll definitely have there. you on again. Uh, this is a longer chat just because we were trying to catch up with a whole bunch of topics. We'll try to keep them shorter in the future, and uh, we'll let our audience know when we're going to have you on again, so they can ask, ask you some questions if they want to. Dan, I really appreciate the time and uh, and calling out and, and putting me on and say hi to Matt when he comes back. Yeah, we'll, for me uh, as well. we'll talk and to you. Sounds I look like forward to the next December. time. Well, there you go. That was our first chat with Stockton's Finest. We'll do these again uh, in a few weeks. And if you have any questions, we'll let you know on, on the show. And we'll also let you know on our social media when that's coming up. So you can ask us questions through Twitter, as you heard Renee did. Thanks, Renee. Um, and we'd love to get your thoughts, questions, opinions on Stockton Heat as well. But Matt, that leads us to the end of our show, which as we know is prediction time. And you and I didn't do too well last week. Um, I thought that we would win against St. Louis, New Jersey, lose to Arizona. You thought just the New Jersey win. So let's see if we can do better this week. We've got three games in the docket. The Flames' first Wednesday night game of the whole season. That sounds weird to say. They've got three days off, the 10th, 11th, 12th. Come back to play on the 13th. Then they get the 14th, 15th off. They play a 2 p.m. game in Arizona on Saturday and a 5 p.m. game in Vegas on Sunday. So three games, one at home, and a back-to-back on the road. What do you think, Matt? Well, I think that they'll split the weekend games and they'll beat Dallas. Which one do you think they win? I'll go with the Arizona just because the Flames suck against the Golden Knights for whatever reason. Dallas, I think, is going to be a good me- measuring stick. I like the team they've put together. I think that's going to be a game where we have to play or we're going to be out of it early. Yeah, and they did a good job last time they met the Stars. It's just, yeah, Dallas seems to be struggling for some reason, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, they only have 18 points in 18 games, and... You know, they're just kind of there right at this point. And I wouldn't be – like, they are 7-2-1 and one in their last 10, so they have bounced back. But, you know, there's just – you know – Right now they, the, they sh- Yeah, they right should now be the better Flames than – 23 points. They're behind only Edmonton and the Pacific. If we look at Dallas, Dallas – is Dallas has got 18 points, 8-8-2. Eight, eight, and two. So they're, they're struggling a bit right now. Yeah. Vegas we'll see. is struggling a bit now, too. Oh, I know. That, that's the one good thing about the Flames' start to the season because, like, you know that teams like uh, Vancouver, Edmonton, and even Arizona are kind of paper tigers 
because they just don't have the depth to sustain where they're at throughout the whole season. But you, well, know, you and I were talking about this before we recorded today. Like, I almost think that we're going to see almost a complete flip in our division. Edmonton's got to fall. I think Calgary, Vegas, and San Jose will be the top three in the division in some it, form or fashion. So, yeah, you know, I with think Arizona behind. Fall. Yeah, I think Arizona will be the fourth team in our division. And yeah, then, I agree. Uh, Vancouver, Anaheim, and Edmonton will be the next three, and LA will be way down at the bottom. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think you're right on those. I just, I don't know. Like, right now, it almost looks like, hey, we're second in the division. We're starting to pick things up. Just keep playing your game and let the division flip itself around around you. But when Edmonton's number one at 26 points, it tells you something's not right in the universe. Yeah, it like you can tell because like McDavid and Drysidel and Neil have to start cooling down because like it's not you can't expect like Neil to be a fifty goal guy like come on <laughs> you know it it just it's not gonna happen and their whole team it it's yeah like they're outside of like five players they don't have any depth so like and they're good those five guys don't get me wrong it's just yeah it's not sustainable over a full season and especially when mike smith's gonna start faltering at some point i'm gonna go a little bit differently on my prediction this week i'm gonna go with what doesn't usually happen and that's that they lose the home game and win both on the back-to-back oh yeah I think this is going to be a good trip for them to establish themselves with a more simple road game. Yeah, well, I think that, uh, like last year, we had very much the same problem where the team, they didn't have any practice time. And, like, they were kind of waffling for basically the first month and a bit of last season, too. And, like, they just couldn't get any cohesion and everything... Like, they were just disjointed. Like, they'd have the odd good game, but on the whole, they just, they weren't themselves. Then they got that little break where they had a couple of days to actually just practice, and the team tore off after that. And I think that if the Flames, with, they only have one game in six days. So, with that, if they can get their stuff together and you know, address some of the glaring issues with the team, I think that this could be the start of a long run for the team. See, last week you and I said that the break would probably be good for these guys. I'm actually now starting to worry about this break because they're just starting to get going. I really don't want them now to sit for a couple days. Like, I think that that's why I think the Dallas game might not go their way because I'm thinking that sitting for too long, they might now be sort of getting rusty again. Mm -hmm. I think when you're getting going, the best thing you can do is just get the reps in. Yeah, and with, uh, I think that in a way it's helpful as well, um, just because that St. Louis game, it being the last one that they have a memory of, that helps because the coaching staff, if they're working with little details, they can use the game that is fresh in their mind where they did have trouble but they still managed to be successful in getting a point, but they can figure out how to fix the problems even though they were getting on a roll because they still have work to do. Yeah, and they have time on the plane and before that game to you know ma make sure they're watching that video, even if it's not the one that's fresh. I think there's a lot of video from this week, both good and bad, that the team can learn from. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, that's it for this week. We will talk to you next week. Enjoy the uh, the Saturday at 2 p.m. game. That's going to be a weird one for us to get used to. Oh, I know. I, I always hate afternoon games. It's not as bad as the 11 a.m. games. We get those once in a while. Yeah. It, it just, it, you, you wake up, you're eating breakfast, and, oh, it's time for hockey. Like, what? You know, like, it just, well, it, like it just I'm talking it about the 11 like o'clock. It takes so much out of my day. Yeah. Because, like, everything's kind of, you know, and I can imagine that the players, it's like, uh, we're getting ready for a morning skate. Oh, no, we're not. We're playing. Like, it's just, yeah, it's a little weird, those, ty those type of games. And I can understand why when they play those type of games, if they're a little disjointed because, you know, it's just so weird. 
Well, we'll see what happens, and hopefully the Flames will, uh, I, I think, sweeping this week would be awesome, but hopefully they'll get the four points that we're expecting. Matt, we'll talk to you next week. Yep, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.